Hey, hey there, chemistry team. It's your chemistry coach coming at you on another bright and early, somewhat sunny day. We're stepping into new territory today. We are done with equilibrium and all those multiple chapters of equilibrium and getting into the dreaded thermodynamics. Now, that could be a curse word for some of you. It could be a love affair for some of you. I don't know. You, you tend to either love it or hate it. <laughs> and we reviewed a little bit of this last semester. Um, just took a small branch of thermodynamics called thermochemistry, looking at uh, energy changes, right? Internal energy changes of systems uh, based on heat flow, right? Uh, from the system to the surroundings or surroundings to the system. So if you're feeling a little rusty on that, you might want to go back and review. Uh, I put a couple of videos, uh, review videos up for um, thermal chemistry. For us, that was chapter seven last semester. Um, and you can look at my review PowerPoints and things like that. I highly recommend it because we're going to carry a lot of those fundamental principles into this chapter on thermodynamics. Now for our class, the chapter depends on the edition you have, right? Some, some, some of the newer editions might be chapter 13. Some of the older ones might be chapter 19. So you can just look it up in your index and find thermodynamics. You can't miss it. Uh, it's a doozer. <laughs> so in the general question I always had in thermodynamics, questions, two questions, right? If I'm on a test, what equation do I use? And two, where's the negative sign go? <laughs> right? I was like, oh, right? Is it going from the system to the surroundings? And we use the viewpoint of the system. And if the energy of the system's decreasing, it's going to be negative. If it's increasing, it's going to be positive. So if the surroundings is doing something on the system, causing its energy to go up, it's positive. You're like, oh my goodness. So I highly recommend you review things. But just on a qualitative level, just to simple, I like to try to take complicated ideas and just simplify them. Simple guy, right? This is the branch of chemistry, science in general. A lot of overlap with physics when we're in thermodynamics, so some of you are going to love this. We're looking at energy, right? Because, you know, we, last semester we looked at matter pretty much most of the semester. 95% of the semester was looking at matter and changes in matter and how we can manipulate that to create things we like. So now we're going to focus on energy and the changes that energy undergoes. All right, that's the focus. In general, right, in general, thermodynamics will tell you or be able to quantitatively give you a number that will predict whether a particular process or reaction should actually occur as written under its given states. It's given temperature, it's given pressure, different, you know, given composition, all those kinds of things. As written, Will that occur? And there's some terms for that in thermodynamics we're going to get to in a second. It's called spontaneity. We'll get to that on the next board. When I introduced uh, the second semester of general chemistry, I pretty much gave you three questions. I don't know if you remember. Right? One, does a reaction occur? Right? That'd be a good question to ask. Does, does this process happen? Two, if it does happen, how fast? Right? And... If it does happen, and you know how fast it is, how far does it go? Right? Does it go 100% to products? Uh, you know, does it only react 3%? You know, those kinds of things. And those three questions cover most of the second semester of general chemistry. So we've already looked at how fast. That was kinetics, right? So if a reaction occurs, how fast does it go? That's kinetics. We looked at equilibrium. That tells you how far something goes, like a weak acid might uh, undergo uh, an ionization in water to 2.5% or something like that, where it's a strong acid might be to 100%, and then you've got products and reactants both existing in equilibrium. So how far does that go? That would be more equilibrium, okay? Thermodynamics kind of answers that question, will that process proceed as written? How favorable is it? All right, so thermodynamics, how favorable, kinetics, how fast, equilibrium, how far. Those are your general three questions. And oh, there's a lot of calculations involved with those. So kinetics, check, equilibrium, check. Now we've got thermodynamics. And some books do this earlier, some do it later, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. So we happen to be doing it now. So let's take a look at this idea of spontaneity, where if you are more of a, into the biology or biochemistry, you cover this concept a lot. So let's pop a little introduction into spontaneity on the next board. 
All right, so you've probably heard this term before, spontaneity. All right? We didn't mention this at all when we covered thermal chemistry last semester because uh, it's kind of a broader viewpoint. There's, there's several things involved with it. We're, we'll look at this a little more quantitatively on the next board uh, and a little qualitatively now. But really, thermodynamics, the whole chapter is just a buildup of a story for this one thing, the ultimate question. You know, here's a reaction, here's a process. Does this occur as written under the specifications of pressure, temperature, composition, all this stuff there? Will it happen? What parameters do we need to know to be able to answer that question? Can we, can we condense all of these factors down to one simple thermodynamic variable? And does that number have to be bigger than a certain number for it to happen? And if it's smaller than a certain number, will it not happen, right? Do we have some defined thing? So we're going to spend this whole chapter developing that. But really, we can do thermodynamics in like 20 seconds to just say, hey, spontaneity, spontaneous. A process is spontaneous, right, if it occurs without any outside help. Quantitative, we will look later at something called Gibbs energy or Gibbs free energy, right? And if that value is negative, it'll happen. If it's, if it's positive, it won't happen. Pretty much comes down to that thing. But what, what does that one thermodynamic variable um, break down into? And we got to do that, right? <laughs> it's going to be a long process, about a, about a 10 video process to do that. All right. Non-spontaneous would mean, of course, under the, the specifications of that process, it's not going to happen as written. It, now, it doesn't mean it can't happen, right? A non-spontaneous a process does not mean it cannot happen. It just won't happen on its own. It requires a little bit of help, right? I need I need some help to go. We got to put some energy input. We got to increase the temperature, do something to it to get it going. You know, think about rechargeable batteries or something like that, right? Um, they they spontaneously work until they run out, and then what you got to do is you got to plug it in the wall, get that electricity in there to cause the reverse. Uh, reaction in there to happen, all right? And then you can run it again and then reverse it again by putting energy in. But the spontaneous process, right, of the battery gives you that energy, that chemical reaction that is occurring in there. Um, but once that runs out, it's not going to happen in the reverse direction without any help, okay? So pretty qualitative way of looking at it. But let's break this down into a couple of parts, and then we'll spend some time developing those parts. All right. Major oversimplification here, but it's going to kind of introduce uh, some concepts that we uh, are going to get into in this chapter, and then, you know, some of the stuff we've looked at before. So spontaneity, right? So what is that going to be broken up into? What factors really help determine whether a process will occur as written or not, right? Enthalpy change. And this is about the only way. So warning, 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 red flag. We tend to think this way because this is how we learned it in introductory chemistry um, or uh, first semester. But we're in varsity chemistry now. We gotta we gotta think a little bit differently. There's more to the picture, All right? Some of you may have saw uh, some cracks in this idea last semester, but didn't say anything about it. So we looked at enthalpy change, and if you don't remember that, go back. Uh, I put a video up from thermal chemistry from last semester. You can review on heat. Um, and you can review my notes on that. But if you remember, H was a thermodynamic parameter called enthalpy, like heat, right? So a lot of people call it heat. Um, and essentially, well, let's take a look at it. So we defined the change in enthalpy as the change in the internal energy of the system plus any work that was done, right? P delta V, gas expansion, gas contraction. But if no work is done, say we're not changing moles of gas, then the change in the internal energy of the system is the change in the enthalpy, which we call the heat that'll happen at constant pressure. So if we're at constant pressure, um, and uh, I mean constant volume, this goes off. So con well, that's you can review the last video. I'm, I, I'm, I tend to go into the review and it lengthens this video. So I'm saying if you're at constant volume, those are equal to each other. But if you're at constant pressure, this is the heat flow at constant pressure. Um, so you can think of this as Q sub P. All right, so delta H would be the heat flow at constant pressure. Go review the video because I spent about 
18 minutes talking about what I just mentioned in the last 10 seconds, <laughs> right? I don't want to get into it. I just, I want to, but I can't. All right. And you probably remember these terms, right? Exothermic and endothermic. Go review that. So if, an ener if a system is losing energy, right, and that energy is released from the system to the surroundings as heat flow, exo means to give off, right? That would give you a negative delta H value. And if uh, the energy of the system is increasing because heat energy is coming from the surroundings to the system as heat, the energy of the system is going up, right? So endo means to take in, so that's endothermic. That would be a positive delta H, which I just erased with my finger. And this is the trap. I want to get you out of this way of thinking. The way we thought last semester was that an exothermic process always occurred and an endothermic process didn't because an endothermic process was an uphill energy climb. We drew those little energy curves, right? Uphill, all right? Um, whereas exothermic was downhill. Right, water flows downhill, it makes sense, but that's not the only factor. Just because something is an exothermic, yes, it's favorable, but it doesn't mean it's spontaneous because there are some other factors involved that we hadn't talked about before. So, try to get away from that. Yes, many things, if not most things that are exothermic, are going to be spontaneous, they will happen, but not all. Right, there's some endothermic processes, like you know, say, take an ice cube. Right? It requires energy to convert the solid ice to liquid uh, water, right? It requires energy, but it happens on its own, right? You take it at any temperature above zero, it's just going to happen spontaneously. So why would that be a spontaneous process, even though it's endothermic, right? So something to ponder. That other term, the new term for this, and I'm going to have to spend several videos introducing this concept, talking about it qualitatively and quantitatively, is this entropy factor. So really, there's two main things to this, two sides to the spontaneity coin. One side is the enthalpy change. The other side is the entropy change. And sometimes they work together, right? They're both favorable. Sometimes they, they are both not favorable. Okay, so if they're both favorable, that would be a spontaneous process. If they're both not favorable, it would be a non-spontaneous process. But sometimes the enthalpy part is favorable. The entropy part is not favorable. So they, they go against each other. So now you got to look at, is the entropy change more than the enthalpy change, which makes the overall process favorable? Or maybe the enthalpy change is more favorable than the entropy change, and so it is. Or maybe one dominates the other. All right? So we have to look at that numerically and quantitatively. And I'm not going to get into the entropy at this point. We're going to talk about that. But most of you probably heard of this as the tendency towards disorder, randomness, chaos, right? Uh, you look at, uh, what was that, Jurassic Park or something with Jeff Goldblum talking about chaos theory and just randomness. Um, so, yes, the, you know, the universe tends towards disorder, disorderly processes, um, are, sp are favorable, not necessarily spontaneous per se, because you got to look at both factors, but they tend towards favorability, right? I have four kids. The bedrooms just get messy, right? I walk in one of the rooms, you know, I'm like, oh my God, I can't even step on this floor. There's clothes everywhere. You know, it's like, holy moly, what is going on? So just uh, disorder just seems to re require less energy. That's not really what it is. But to, in order to to organize their room requires focused input, right? It's not a natural process. You know, you leave a bike out, it's, it's for years, it's gonna rust and it's gonna start falling apart. You, you can see it, right? But we're gonna quantitatively put that together in this construct, this concept called entropy and specifically entropy change. So we're gonna look at absolute entropies, just S, and then entropy changes when a process occurs or a reaction occurs. Does that entropy change cause more disorder, more randomness. And we'll put that in more chemical terms um, when we look at it in the next video. And of course, temperature, I don't really need to put temperature in there, but uh, but uh, temperature obviously is going to pretty much occur in most of our equations in thermodynamics. Uh, processes are very heavily temperature dependent for spontaneity processes, right? Um, so let's start. Uh, I think I'll, I'll kill this video at this point and then let's get in. Let's introduce uh, entropy and those kinds of things. But I highly, highly recommend you review the concept of enthalpy and heat um, from last semester's thermochemistry. Highly recommend it.